Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahillahi rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulihi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So brothers and sisters, um this is a brief presentation in relation to uh, Hajj and Umrah and some of the main elements that are required for our Umrah and our Hajj to be successful. So there are some handouts that were given to all of you and those of you that don't have it, uh, inshallah the photocopies are being made and you will be receiving them very shortly inshallah. Uh, but basically some of the major points are, are placed on that handout and you can either follow along or just uh, keep your attention on the slides and inshallah you'll have an idea of uh, the main points and the main regulations that are required for a successful uh, Hajj inshallah. So uh, before I start I'm just going to explain the sequence that's uh, involved here. Number one uh, we're going to do a little introduction and number two is I'm going to explain to you step by step the procedures and the regulations regarding Umrah and then I will explain to you uh, some regulations and some of the main uh, tenants for the completion of Hajj and then uh, inshallah we will uh, break for a short while as mentioned earlier and then we'll come back and inshallah I'll talk a little about the spiritual journey of, uh, of, of the Hajj and then finally we'll have uh, some question and answers and through that uh, any points that you may have noted during the presentation and you wanted some more clarification or you have some other question related to uh, those tenants, inshallah I'll be more than happy to uh, answer those questions. So I want to begin by uh, mentioning a verse of the Holy Quran. And uh, the verse of the Quran speaks about the importance of Hajj and also this duty. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? He says, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ إِسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا That it's a duty upon those who have the ability to perform hajj for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who are able to. So, mashaAllah, all of you brothers and sisters have uh, taken upon this duty and Allah has accepted you for this duty and for this great uh, tenant of deen. It's one of the pillars of Islam. The Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, says, Buniya al-Islam ala khams, that the, the deen of Islam is established on five pillars. And we know that one of the pillars is Hajj to complete the pilgrimage. So all of you are very fortunate and all of you are indeed uh, praiseworthy and, and worthy of great uh, excellence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted you and you've made the intention. So we'll pray and we make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ease your journey and inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enable you a successful completion of the Hajj. Now in terms of the virtues of Hajj, there's so many narrations that we could talk about, but just a brief little idea about some of the virtues regarding uh, Hajj. Uh, there is a hadith of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, narrated in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim, where the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, says, Al-Hajj al-Mabrur laysa lahu jaza'un illa al-Jannah. That when a person completes a righteous or a accepted Hajj, then there is no compensation, there is no return for that except Jannah, except Paradise. And we find another narration of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, where the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, says, رَجَعَكَ يَوْمٍ وَلَدَتْهُ أُمُّهُ That when a person returns from Hajj, then they are cleaned and purified from their sin, from their evil, just like a newborn baby that has no sin, that has no evil on, on its record. Uh, at one occasion, a person came in the presence of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, and he asked a question. The question was, Ayyul amali afdal? Which is the best of good deeds? So the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, began listing. He said, Imanun billahi wa rasuli. He said, To believe in Allah and the Messenger. Then the person asked, Thumma madha? And thereafter, What is the most best of good deeds? So the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, res responded by saying, Al jihadu fi sabilillah, to struggle and strive uh, in the path of Allah. And then the, the man asked again, Thumma madha? What after? The Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, responded by saying, Hajjun mabrur, an accepted Hajj, a righteous Hajj, is also uh, one of the greatest and, and best of deeds. 
Aisha radiyallahu anha once asked the Prophet peace and blessings upon him. Uh, ya Rasulullah, nara al-jihad afdal al-a'mali afala nujahid. That the men, they go out in the path of Allah and they struggle and they strive. And many times in the campaigns they, they, they participate. How do we uh, go about doing th- this great deed? So the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, responded to Aisha radiallahu anha, لَكُنَّ أَفْضَلَ الْجِهَادِ حَجُّ mabrur. Your jihad as women is you will do hajjul mabrur. You will, do, uh, you will perform hajj and Allah will give you the great rewards. So we can see from all of these narrations and there's so many others that hajj is a means of increasing our blessings, being forgiven of sin and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So again we pray and we supplicate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you uh, with an accepted hajj. Okay, so now um, I'm going to explain Umrah and basically before we will be performing Hajj, we're going to be performing Umrah. And this is why it's important to have uh, the main tenets and the main points regarding Umrah uh, before us. So we have to remember that there are, there are four main parts of Umrah. Two of them are Fard and two of them are Wajib. Fard means it's mandatory. If we don't do them, then our Umrah will be incomplete. It won't be da- completed. And wajib is necessary elements that, again, if we don't do them, there's going to be deficiency in our Umrah. So these four points are also mentioned in your handout. But just to give you a summary here, uh, the, the mandatory acts of Umrah are two. Number one is ihram, which refers to a particular type of dressing and an intention. And number two is tawaf, going around the Kaaba. So these are the two main requirements of Umrah. And the two wajib or necessary elements of Umrah are sa'i, to walk between the two posts, Safa and Marwa, and uh, to finally trim or shave our hair. And I'm going to speak about all of these four points in somewhat of a little more detail, inshallah. So... To summarize, there are four parts that are mandatory or required for the completion of our Umrah. One is Ihram, one is Tawaf, one is Sa'i, and one is Halaq. So let's look at these step by step. Number one, Ihram. Ihram refers to a required type of dressing. Literally, the word Ihram comes from Haram or Haram, which means to be sacred or forbidden. So because when we get into our Ihram, when we don our Ihram clothing, and we make the intention, then certain things are forbidden. And another meaning of it is that it's sacred. That means we are in a state of sacredness. We are in a state of a particular ritual that we are about to perform. So when we're in that state, then only can we complete the obligation of the Hajj and the Umrah. So the first part of Ihram is that we, before we enter a specific boundary, which is known as Miqat. Miqat refers to the boundary. Now this is specified by the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him. On the screen here, you see uh, a map. And the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, he noted all these places. Dhul Hulayfa, Dhatul Iraq, Qarnul Manazil, Yalamlam, Jeddah, and Rabiq as uh, a place for that boundary. So meaning that before we get into this boundary, we have to have the intention and we have to be in the state of Ihram. We have to have the clothing of Ihram on. Now, to make it very simple, I've also specified in the handout, two hours before landing, if we've made the intention and we have the ihram on, then we're good. Okay? If we're first going to Mecca, then we should have it before we land. Before we land at Jeddah, we should have it. However, if we're first going to Medina, then we can put on our ihram and make the intention before leaving Medina. Okay, so this is the first part, that before the miqat, before the boundary, we should be in the state of ihram. The second element is that we have to either take a bath or get into wudu. Wudu is the minimum, but it is recommended that we should also take a bath. So before we make the intention of ihram, before we put on the clothing of ihram, we should either do one of the two. Either take a bath, if it's appropriate, if we're in our hotels or if um, uh, it's opportunity to take a bath, then we take a bath and put on the ihram. But if we can't for some reason, we're on the flight and there's no place to, to take a bath, then the minimum is we make wudu. We should be in the state of wudu. So we take a bath or we make wudu. We make ablution. 
after doing that, we put on our ihram. The clothing for men is their two garments, okay, two sheets. One would cover the bottom portion of our bodies and one would cover the upper portion of the body, as we see in this, uh, in the, on the screen here in this picture. And for the sisters, it's your normal clothing. You simply have to just put that clothing on and it should be Islamic in the sense that it covers uh, all portions of your body other than your face, your hands and your feet. And in doing that, you would be in the state of ihram when you make the intention. Now, after we've put on the clothing of ihram, then we're going to perform two rakahs. We're going to perform two rakahs. Okay, according to some scholars, this is necessary. It's part of the ihram and other to other scholars, they say that it's recommended. But nevertheless, all the scholars do say that we should perform the two rakahs. The two rakahs we're going to perform just like any two rakahs that we perform of salah, nafil salah, optional prayer. And any surahs can be recited. After performing the two rakahs, then we're going to recite the talbiyah. This is our intention now. What is the talbiyah? It's the statement that we're going to be repeating throughout Hajj and throughout Umrah. And it's on the screen here uh, in Arabic in the transliteration and also the translation is there. Labayk Allahumma labayk. لبيك لا شريك لك لبيك إن الحمد والنعمة لك والملك لا شريك لك. So we're gonna be saying this after we've performed the two uh, rakahs, and now we're gonna make the intention. And the intention just has to be in your mind. This is the minimum. You don't have to literally say it. You don't have to verbalize it. If you say it, that's fine. But it, it should be in your mind that now I am in the state of ihram. And I'm making intention to perform Umrah or Hajj for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So this is our intention. Now once we are in the state of Ihram, there are certain things that are now forbidden for us. Just like when we go into the state of fasting, when we're keeping Roza, when we're fasting Siyam, then certain things become forbidden for us. So when we're in the state of Ihram, now certain things become forbidden for us. The list is in your handout. But the main things are, I've, been put, I've put on the screen here. Number one is we cannot trim or shave our hair. We cannot trim or shave our hair. So before we get into ihram, we should take care of our hair and our nails, etc. So that when we are in the state of ihram, then we, we don't have to worry about those things. Right? So before traveling, uh, you know, uh, trim all your hair, whatever needs to be shaven and trimmed, etc. Take care of that. Similarly, nails. We cannot clip our nails in the state of ihram. So while in the state of ihram, this is forbidden. We should do this before we get into the state of ihram. Another prohibition is that no, type, no scents are allowed. Meaning no perfume, no scents while in the state of ihram. Okay? And no marital relations. While in the state of ihram, we cannot engage in any form of marital relations. And all forms of sin... And all forms of argumentation, etc., are forbidden in the state of ihram. Allah says in the Holy Quran, "Fala rafatha, wala fusuqa, wala jidala fil hajj." Fala rafath means there is no indecent talk. Fala rafath, wala fusuq. There is no sin. There is no transgression. Wala jidal, and there is no argumentation. Okay, so we want to make sure that we are performing our hajj in the best possible way. So we should try and avoid all of these things that are prohibited. Now in particular for the men, and I'm going to come back to the specific rules for the women towards the conclusion, but right now in the state of Ihram there are some specific guidelines for men that is men cannot wear any form of stitch clothing. So no underwears, no t-shirts, just those two sheets, one at the top and one at the bottom. And for men we cannot cover our head or face in the state of ihram. So those of us who are accustomed to wearing headgear or topi or like I always usually wear a turban. If I'm in the state of ihram, I cannot cover my head. We cannot wear any form of headgear. We cannot cover our face also. Okay, to wear foot, footwear that covers the forefoot and ankles. This is also prohibited. So our sandals or our footgear for men... The upper portion of our foot should be exposed, right? So I've given a picture here of a flip-flop. So this is something that is ideal. So if it's covering your 
uh, if it's covering your, if the sandal you're wearing is covering your forefoot, that means the upper portion of your foot, then that would not be appropriate for your ihram. So make sure that the sandals that you take, uh, they should expose your upper portion of the foot and, um, uh, and this would complete the requirement for the ihram. So these are specific guidelines for the men. So this is number one done. The first element of uh, ihram, I mean of, of umrah, is that we're going to get into the state of ihram. Those were all the guidelines of ihram. The second element is now we're going to make tawaf. Okay, we're going to make tawaf. Tawaf literally means to go around. Okay, to circle, to go around. So, when we are ready to perform our tawaf, it begins from the hajrul aswad. It begins from the black stone. Where is the black stone? Here is a uh, picture of the Kaaba. So the corner where the black stone is, you will see embroidery on the Kaaba. This embroidery is not found on the other corners. This is a symbol that the Hajrul Aswad uh, is, the, the black stone is on this corner. Okay? This is a closer image of the black stone. This is the corner that we start our tawaf from. And again, the embroidery is only on the section uh, where uh, the uh, the Hajrul Aswad is. It's not on the other corners. Okay, another sign of it is that if we look at this aerial view of the Haram, okay, we see two minarets on every side except the side where the Hajrul Aswad is. You see on this side here, there's only one minaret. This means that that's the, that's the corner where you start your tawaf from. Okay? Another sign is that when you're closer to the, to the Kaaba, if you look towards the minaret, there will be a green light. There will be a green light there, and that signifies that this is uh, the starting point of the tawaf. So all these are signs to help you understand where you're going to start your tawaf. Okay? Now, here's a little diagram to help us understand. So, here's the Hajr al-Aswad. We're going to go around. Okay? That's one round when we come back to it. So, we're going to go around how many times? Seven times. Okay? We're going to go around seven times. Okay? On this diagram, it's showing you a couple of things. This is the Hatim or Hajr Ismail. This is what we call it. So, basically, the history or the background to that is that uh, when the uh, Quraysh, they wanted to rebuild the Kaaba after it was destroyed, they didn't have enough permissible money. So they only had sufficient money to build the Kaaba in the way we see it now. But the other portion, they only had sufficient funds to make this Hatim. So this is actually part of being inside the Kaaba. So when you make your Tawaf, you're supposed to go around it. Don't go inside it. Okay? So you go around it. The other thing is the Yemeni corner. When the Prophet ﷺ would make tawaf, he would come to the Yemeni corner and he would say, "Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab nar." He would make this du'a, and the Prophet ﷺ says in the narration, "Whoever says Rabbana atina fi dunya at the Yemeni corner, seventy thousand angels make du'a of maghfira, make du'a of forgiveness for that person who's doing that." Okay. So again, we're gonna go around uh, seven times. And once we've completed the seven rounds, then the next step will start. Okay? And the next step is that the Maqam Ibrahim. Maqam Ibrahim is known as the station of Ibrahim. Allah says in the Holy Quran, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ musalla. Make the place of the station of Abraham, station of Ibrahim, a place of prayer. So after we complete the tawaf, we're going to offer two rakahs. We're going to offer two rakahs. Somewhere near or around the Maqam Ibrahim if there is space. Now look at this picture here. This is a picture taken where at a busy time. So there is, it's impossible for us to perform two rakahs near the Maqam Ibrahim. So if it's impossible, then anywhere in the Haram. Anywhere in the Haram we can perform the, the two rakahs after we've completed the seven rounds. Okay? After we complete the seven rounds, we perform two rakahs. Okay? And after performing the two rakahs, we're going to go to drink Zamzam. This is an image of the stations that are right across the Maqam Ibrahim. So let's go back to the diagram that I was showing you. So 
you complete your tawaf here, the seventh round, you're going to perform two rakahs. And then after performing two rakahs, there are stations to drink the zamzam water. Okay? Right behind the maqam Ibrahim towards the wall. And it looks something like this. And you would uh, drink the zamzam water. So after drinking the zamzam water, this part of the umrah is now complete. Number one is we completed ihram. Number two is we completed tawaf. Now we're going on to the third part. This is the wajib part. Okay, which is known as sa'i. Sa'i means to run. Sa'i means to quickly jog or run. Okay, so what is involved in sa'i? Basically, we're walking from Safa, the mountain of Safa, to the mountain of Marwa. Where is the mountain of Safa? Right here. Where is the mountain of Marwa? Right here. So this long, this is the aerial view. So this is where the mountain of Safa is, and this is where the mountain of Marwa is. Obviously, the structure is built over it now, so it's only a small hill. And I'll show you some pictures. So basically, we're going to go f start from Safa. We just drank Zamzam. After drinking Zamzam, we're going to come towards uh, Safa. We get near the mountain of Safa. We make the intention that we're performing uh, uh, Sa'i. And we're going to go from Safa to Marwa. Okay, Safa to Marwa, that's one. From Marwa to Safa, that's two. Again, from Safa to Marwa, that's going to be three, four, five, six, and seven. So we start at Safa and we complete at Marwa. Okay? So it's not a complete circle that makes one. It's actually just by going to one, it becomes one. Okay? And then coming back to the where we started, that becomes three. Okay? So that way, we're going to go back and forth. We'll start at Safa. Will end at Marwa. Okay? Uh, there's no specific recitations. You can simply just make the dhikr or recite some du'as, etc., while we are making sa'i. And same thing with tawaf. There's no specific recitations. Any du'as or any recitations or dhikr we can do. If we simply say, Labbaik Allahumma Labbaik, that's also uh, sufficient. Okay? Now here is an image, an older image of Safa, where when they didn't cordon it off. So people would actually climb onto the mountain and sit there and then go on. But now what they've done is they've cordoned it off. As you see in this newer image, they've put a glass barrier there. So we simply go near it and then we proceed to Marwa. Okay? So here's uh, uh, some hujjaj or umar who are now going between Safa and Marwa. And this is how it looks. They're traveling, they're, they're walking between the, the, the two mountains. Okay? Now there are green lights as you can see in this image, okay, and the idea there is for men, for men to quicken their pace a little, okay. The men will quickly walk or jog and then when they get to the other light, that's where they will stop, okay. If they have their women with them, their wives or their family members with them, then there's no problem. They can wait at the end of the green light. And uh, once they catch up with their family, then they can continue, they can proceed. Okay? So here's another image of the two green lights. So in between these two green lights, we're going to be, uh, the men will quicken their pace. And then we're going to get to Marwa. Here's an image of Marwa. And uh, when we get to Marwa, we can make a little dua and then continue. Okay, back to Safa. Back and forth until we complete at, at Marwa. Okay? Now, so we've completed three parts. We've done ihram, we've done tawaf, and we've done sa'i. Now there's one part left, and that is halaq and qasr. Halaq means to shave, and qasr means to trim. So the halaq, okay, it's recommended for men, okay, but it is permitted for them to also, if they don't want to shave their hair of their head, then they can trim. But at least one inch should be taken off one inch of our hair from all sides and for women obviously they're just going to trim from the bottom of their hair about one inch okay so uh, there are a number of uh, uh, you know barber shops there where they would do that and uh, one important point is when we're in the state of ihram we're not allowed to trim or cut hair correct so if we're still in ihram we cannot trim the hair or shave the hair of someone else. 
Okay, we have to first ask someone else to trim our hair or shave, shave our hair. And then once we're out of that situation of ihram, now if we're trimming or shaving someone else's hair, that is fine. Okay, so that completes the main elements of Umrah. Your Umrah is complete. Four steps. You do ihram, you make tawaf, you make sa'i, and then you trim or shave your hair. That completes the Umrah. Okay? Now we're going on to Hajj. Most of you are doing what we call Tamattu'ah. There are three types of Hajj. One is Ifrad, that means you only go to do Hajj. And most of us, we don't only go to do Hajj, we go to do Umrah and Hajj. Right? So, there's two types apart from Ifrad. That is what we call Qiran and Tamattu. Qiran means you put on the Ihram and with the same Ihram, you're going to do Umrah and Hajj. So after you shave your hair, you don't get out of your ihram. You stay in that ihram and you do hajj. And this is the most difficult and it's the most rewarding. Most of us are not doing that. What we do is we do tamattu. Tamattu means you get into the state of ihram, you perform your umrah, and then you get out of the state of ihram. Okay? And then when it's time for hajj, that's when you put on your ihram again with the intention of hajj. Does that make sense? Okay, so... Now when it's time for Hajj, okay, then you're going to prepare yourself for Hajj. Okay? So the days of Hajj are five. Eighth of Dhul Hijjah, ninth of Dhul Hijjah, the tenth of Dhul Hijjah, the eleventh of Dhul Hijjah, and the twelfth of Dhul Hijjah. These are the five days of Hajj. Okay? It's very simple. It's just we have to know what we're doing on each one of these days. Okay? So to give a, a little insight to what we're going to do basically we're in Mecca before we start Hajj okay then from Mecca we're going to go to Mina which is right next door and from Mina we're going to go to Arafat and Arafat is right at the end okay so we go from Mecca to Mina then from Mina to Arafat then from Arafat to Muzdalifa and then back to Mina Okay, and we're going to go step by step, but I'm just giving you a small idea and an understanding so you know what's happening. These are all locations. Mecca is the city of Mecca, then near to it, a few kilometers away, is Mina. Then a few kilometers away is Muzdalifa, and a few kilometers away is Arafat. Okay, but because of the large crowds during Hajj, it's going to take you hours to get to these places. But in general, it's, it's, not, it's, it's at a very close distance. It's just a few kilometers away. Okay, but this is just to give you a little understanding of where each one of these places are. Okay, so the first day of Hajj, it's 8th of Dhul Hijjah. What you're going to do is you're going to get into the state of Ihram. Now, we already learned about Ihram. Okay, when, we, when, we, when I talked about Umrah, we already learned. We're gonna, what are we going to do? We're going to make sure that we get, onto the, we get into the clothes of Ihram, number one. We're going to make the intention. And the intention here is the ihram is for hajj. Okay, we're going to make sure that we make wudu or we take a bath. Okay, perform the two rakahs and make the intention by saying the, the labbaik, the talbiyah. Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. Okay, then after we get into the state of ihram, okay, we're going to leave for mina. So the, uh, I've put there in brackets here, complete all your preparations by the 7th. So we know hajj is starting on the 8th, then all your preparations for Hajj should have already been done before the 8th, right? Okay, in Mina, you're going to stay there and the only thing you're doing there is performing five salahs, okay? You're leaving after sunrise, so you're going to end up in Mina for Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. And the next morning's Fajr. So you're performing five salah there. Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and the next day's Fajr. Okay, there's nothing prescribed while you're in Mina, so you're just doing Nafil Ibadah. Okay, there, in Mina there are tents. Okay, so you make dua, you recite Quran, you make dhikr, you read some uh, books of hadith, etc. That's, that's what we're doing while we are uh, in Mina. Okay, so just to recap, we're going to put on our ihram, we're going to make the intention after sunrise. We've already performed Fajr. After sunrise, we're going to Mina. 
Okay, this is how Mina looks. So in Mina, there's only tents. You see all these tents, you're going to be allocated your numbers for tents. Where the North American stays, you're going to have your band and you're going to know where you're going to be with and your group leaders will direct you there. But basically, you're going to be there in Mina and the only thing you're doing there is all forms of ibadah and you're performing five salah. Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha and the Fajr of the next day. The next day is the ninth of Dhul Hijjah. Okay, this is the second day of Hajj. What are we doing there? We're going to leave for Arafat at after sunrise. Okay, after the sun has risen, then we're going to leave for Arafat, which is the last part in the map that I showed you. And we're going to do wuquf there. And this is as the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, said, Al Hajju Arafah. He said, Hajj is Arafah. Meaning that this is the main farad, this is the main tenant of our Hajj. We have to go there. There's no way that we can not go there. We have to make sure that we spend even a few moments. Okay, any time, the wuquf is necessary any time between the 9th of Dhul Hijjah from midday to dawn the next day. In that time frame, if we there for even one second, then our Hajj is complete. Okay? We are only performing two salahs there, Dhuhr and Asr. Okay? And then after the sun sets, without performing Maghrib, we're going to Muzdalifah. Okay, even though it's Maghrib time, and this is the way the Prophet ﷺ told us how to do it, it's not even, uh, it's Maghrib time, but we're not going to perform the Maghrib Salah. We're going to tra travel towards Muzdalifah. Okay, and in Muzdalifah, that's where we're going to perform our Maghrib and Isha at Isha time. Because by the time we reach there, it's already going to be Isha time. Okay, and what else we're going to do there is we're going to collect 70 pebbles. We're going to collect 70 pebbles. So to recap, the first day we went to Mina. We performed five salahs, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, Isha, and the Fajr of the next day. Now, after the sun rises on the 9th, we're going to Arafat. This is an image of Arafat, an aerial view, and you see all the people in big, uh, large crowds. right? All these dots and all these white people in Ihram, they are all hujjaj. Okay? And what are we doing in Arafat? We're performing two salahs, Dhuhr and Asr. Okay, now after the sun is set, okay, now we're heading towards Muzdalifa. We're going to make our way towards Muzdalifa. And when we get to Muzdalifa, we're performing Maghrib and Isha, in which time? In Isha time. And we're collecting how many pebbles? 70 pebbles. Why do we need 70 pebbles? This is why we need 70 pebbles. Because on the 10th, we're going to use 7 pebbles. This is the next day. Right? Tomorrow, the 10th, we're going to use 7 pebbles to throw at the large jamara, At the large post for the devil. And then on the 11th, we're going to need 21 for each. 7 for each. Okay? And 12th, we need 21 again for all 3. And again on the 13th, we need uh, uh, 21. Okay? So here's the next day now, the 10th of Dhul Hijjah. We're going to perform Fajr Salah. This is a busy day, by the way. 10th is a busy day. We're performing Fajr Salah. We're in Muzdalifa and we're going to stay in Muzdalifa from any time from dawn to sunrise. Okay? And it's, it's recommended that we don't leave before dawn. Okay, just before sunrise, we leave to Mina. And upon reaching Mina, what are we going to do? We're going to do the following fourth or three things at least. Rami, which is pelting the, the big jamara. Okay? The large post uh, where Ibrahim alayhi salatu was salam was uh, deterred or, or tried to be told by the devil to not follow Allah's command. So that's where we're going to throw the pebbles, uh, the seven pebbles that we have collected in Muzdalifa. We're going to wait for the signal that our animal has been sacrificed. Okay? Our group leaders will tell us that our animals have now been sacrificed. So after we ha get the news that our animals have been sacrificed, then we can tr sh uh, shave or trim our hair. Okay? Once we've done that, then majority of the parts of our hajj is now complete. Okay? There only remains... Two things. One is tawaf ziyara that we got to go back to Mecca and we got to do the tawaf. We can either do it on this day, the 10th, or we can do it on the 
the following days. Okay? Now, mo majority of the scholars say that the order is necessary in all the first three things. So you have to first pelt. Then you got to make sure that your animal was sacrificed. Then only you can shave and trim your hair. You should not change the order. Okay? And an easy way to remember this is remember the word pass. P means pelting. AS means animal sacrifice. And S means shaving. Right? So on the 10th, you will pelt the large jamara. You will make sure you get the news for your animal sacrifice. Then you will make the arrangements for your hair to be shaven or trimmed. And then we will make uh, the tawaf either on the 10th or the following days. Okay, so to recap, what we're doing is we're performing Fajr in Muzdalifah. Okay, before sunrise, we're going to Mina. In Mina, we're going to be pelting the Jamara. This is an image of the, the post where we pelt. Okay. And then, we're going to get the news that our animal has been sacrificed. And then we're going to shave or trim our hair. And then we're going to make the intentions to go to Mecca to make the Tawaf Ziyarah. Okay, Tawaf Ziyarah is fard. It's, it's necessary. It's, an, it's one of the main elements of the Hajj. It must be done. Okay, regarding the pelting, just a few instructions here. That on the 10th, the timing for pelting is from early dawn to early dawn the next day. Okay. How do you throw? You take the pebble. Okay, you take the pebble and you throw it. Bismillahi Allahu Akbar and you throw it. Next pebble, Bismillahi Allahu Akbar, you throw it. Okay, don't take all the pebbles at once and throw it all together or else it will only be counted as one. Okay. After halaq, on the 10th, after you've shaven your hair or trimmed your hair, then everything that was prohibited in terms of your nails, your hair, perfumes, etc., marital, uh, etc., they all now become permissible except the one thing, except marital relations. This is this remains prohibited. Okay. Now you're going to do your tawaf ziyara, and as I mentioned, it's fard, it's mandatory. You have to do it. Now the 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 the, the ruling regarding the tawaf ziyara is that it can be done on the tenth, the eleventh, and on the twelfth up to sunset. Okay, so it doesn't have to be done on that same day. You can do it the next day or the following day. Okay, now after you've done your tawaf ziyara, if it's still the 10th, 11th or 12th, you should go back to Mina. And the, the ruling is that you should stay in Mina. Okay, stay in Mina until the end of Hajj. So you go to Mina. Okay, and now the next two days, 11th, 12th, and if you're staying behind for the 13th, there's only one thing you're doing. And that is pelting. There's nothing else. There's only pelting that you're doing on these days. So the only action is Rami, which is pelting. And you're going to go in this order. You're going to pelt the small jamara, the small uh, post for the devil. Then the middle one and then the larger one. Okay. The timing again is from 11th. On the 11th and 12th is from Zawal, which means midday to Subah Sadiq, which means early dawn the next morning. And uh, there is one ruling that you stop and make dua when you're pelting another one. So in between two, two jamarat, you can stop and you can make a small dua and then you go and pelt the next one. If you're not pelting after, then there's no dua. You get it? So the ruling is dua is only between the jamarat. Okay. And you continue to spend your nights in Mina. And uh, again, here's the diagram that you're in Mina. You come to pelt, you start with the smaller one, you're making dua in between, you pelt the next one, which is the middle jamarat, make dua in between, and then you conclude with pelting the largest one. This is on the 11th, 12th, and 13th. Okay? So 12th and 13th, the same thing as I mentioned earlier. Now, uh, there is uh, a ruling through the verse of the Quran that if you're... You can, after the 12th, you are permitted to leave, what they call the express hajj. Uh, but I guess most of you will be staying there, so you would be completing the pelting on the 13th as well. Okay, once you've done that, then your hajj is complete. Okay, after your hajj is complete, then there's only one thing that remains, which is tawaf al-wida, okay, which is the farewell tawaf, 
and that can be done any time before you leave. But as I said earlier, the tawaf ifada or the tawaf uh, ziyara is fard. That one must be done. This is the farewell tawaf, so any time before leaving it can be done if possible, but it's not mandatory. Okay? So again, to recap here, is we, we got to do the tawaf uh, al, al, al ziyara, that's fard, but the tawaf al wida is recommended if we can. Okay, I was talking about some issues regarding women. Okay, generally these questions come up, so I'll just go through them. In relation to women, the same rules that are for men, they all apply for women, except the following. Women are not permitted to cover their face. In the state of ihram, so those women that wear niqab, okay, they shouldn't be wearing the niqab in the state of ihram. There are some scholars who say that if they wish to cover their face, then they would have to give some charity to compensate for that. Okay, their voice in talbiyah, we shouldn't be screaming or saying it loudly because the awra, the voice of a woman is also awra, unless all the women are saying it together at one time. Okay, there's no ramal in tawaf for women. Ramal basically means uh, to jog or walk quickly with the chest out. For the men, this is recommended. In the first three rounds, for the men, when you're making tawaf around the Kaaba, for the men, it's recommended that they take out their chest and they walk like brave soldiers. Okay? And what's the reason for this? At the time of the Prophet, peace and blessings upon him, the people of Mecca uh, made an allegation that when the Prophet went to Medina, they've become weak, they've become sick, and they're feeble people. So the Prophet ﷺ said, no, we're going to prove it to them that we're not weak. We're going to walk and make the first three rounds of our tawaf, and we're going to walk and jog like soldiers. So this is for men, it's not for women. And there's no running in between the Sa'i, uh, the, the Mount of Safa and Marwa, the hills of Safa and Marwa, under the green lights. This is recommended for men, not for women. And um, uh, there's obviously trimming for the women, not shaving. And uh, if a woman is menstruating during the period of Hajj or Umrah while in the state of Ihram, then she will do all the, all the obligations. The only thing is that she will not make the tawaf. Because that's part of the masjid and uh, the ruling is that uh, a woman when in menstruation, she is not supposed to be entering the masjid. Okay?